How's it going, How's it going YouTube? YouTube. <laughs> hey, it's, uh, it's good to sort of do a different intro here. So we've actually been doing our intros to our podcasts as part of the audio, and that's just sort of too superficial, and we're changing that up definitely. So this is the, the new one for you guys, and we just want to quickly do like a one-minute intro. So this week, we're speaking to an amazing guy. His name is Darren O'Lean. Darren is a superfood hunter based in Malibu and just a super interesting, smart and fascinating guy with so much knowledge to share on superfoods and those sort of things. Hey, Craig. Yeah, he's just uh, super deep as well. And we had the best conversation. We learned so much all about superfoods. So let's get into it now and hear what makes Darren O'Lean ridiculously human. Yeah, Darren. <laughs> hey, Darren, how's it going? Hey. How are you, my man? What's going on? Hey, you good to see your face. Hey, man. It's Craig. He's just joined good us. Good morning. <laughs> well, afternoon. I'm a bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, well, for, for me, it's uh, it's not too bad, but it's it's 8 p.m. and But for Craig, it's 5 a.m. because he's in Australia. So... Um, so, yeah. so no i'm actually in london but we're both from south africa yeah yeah and eliminate the nightmare of not recording at all too <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. that's happened it's, yeah actually i was listening to uh rich was chatting to uh john the other day and yeah. and he didn't it, it cut out halfway through <laughs> oh, oh, devastated. Oh, he was devastated she's <laughs> Yeah, he was freaked out. It, it, happens, it happens to the, to the season of us, eh? pros. Yeah, it, it was so funny. I was listening to it, and then I then he because he said that in the in the second round they had, and I was like straight away I had to message Craig. I was like, no way, yeah. is even Rich. Listen, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get caught. You get caught in between. You know, you're doing this, but you're also already talking, yeah. and and it just yeah. kind of. And then you forget all of these fundamental things. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. We've done it where we've been like, but starstruck or we've been like with someone and then we like, we forget to say, put the headphones on and you know, there's this, and then they're like, afterwards you're like, Oh, there's just what happened to all those things we talk about usually. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like we Waking at dawn. Back cool stuff. All right. Well, good afternoon there, Darren O'Lean. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. How are you doing today? How, how do you not join a ridiculous human podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs> well, yeah, I can tell likewise. you. Yeah, so we're stoked, uh, Darren. We've I've tried to sort of get you on here for over a year now, I think now. And um you know, I'm so glad that we've managed to tee it up. Um, I heard you first quite a few years ago on Rich Roll speaking, and I was like, wow, I'd really like to have a chat to you one day. So now we're doing it. So thanks for helping me tick that box off and chatting to us in person. For sure, man. Cool. So how has your day been anyway? Good, good. Yeah, just uh, on the ground for a few days before I jump off again on a on a new product project uh that i mentioned earlier that i can't quite get into but it's it's right down the path of what i do uh has to do with you know getting some some more media attention and stuff like that so um so i'm on the road for the next three months in several countries exploring some stuff so let's wow, let's say that <laughs> yeah yeah oh, sounds yeah. exciting exactly yeah. And and so like we've always sort of kick off with a few things. You, I'm always like fascinated when I hear you talk about your piece of land in uh, in Malibu. Um, it sounds like you have, I don't know, like your own forest or own this own massive piece of land. Uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, I got I got super fortunate finding this place that's very close to Malibu, and it feels like it's a lifetime away. Uh, yeah. It's kind of mostly raw uh with a 1937 house uh and uh kind of 
shadowing the house is like 300 year old oak trees um mm. and then surrounded by kind of uh, 50 acres of of my land uh but really national park all over the place so there's a river in the backyard literally and um and a lot of elevation changes uh mm. and and full-on uh uh hawks owls bobcats oh. coyotes and mountain lions i've seen all of them uh that literally face to face with all of those things in in the two years that i've been here so it's very much a special zone um and something where you know when i head out to walk with my 90 pound german shepherd and and a machete <laughs> uh uh you know you just you know you're in the wild so um you respect that listen for that and i think it's 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 special to have places like this that's still so close to the world but yet wild uh and there's nothing greater for me to be able to come and call this home and share this space with these group of animals and and this kind of natural ecosystem so it's pretty special uh. It's, I can think of very few things that would be as amazing as that, just to to still be able to run your sort of day to day life and then but come and have that uh, respite and just you know just feel that, that fresh air of your own land and your own space and you're not on top of one another, so it must be pretty amazing. Is it a lot of work for you, but you say it's a lot of it is raw, so I, I guess you're not sitting on your tractor all day mowing the lawn uh there is some places <laughs> that, that, that that you just, you have to, uh, in yeah. terms of just fire protection and yeah. stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a degree of work, but, uh, I, I am not one to shy away from that. And, um, and it's, and it's great to be able to have that, uh, balance of, of, of kind of needing to go out and get dirty and, and, you know, I have trees that fall and, and block the, the area to get mm -hmm. out and I have to clear them and, 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 uh, you know, and clear the brush from certain areas. And, uh, I love that. And it's just, it's, it's, it's part of the, the duty of, of living in a place like this. And, uh, but I, f I find my balance and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's special. And, and, and believe me, I, 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 I need it. Uh, I, you know, this, this kind of world, uh, in its fast paced, big cities, I don't do well, uh, with at all. Um, I, I don't want to live in a city. I don't want to function in that way. It's too stressful. Um, um, I'm too sensitive on that level to that frenetic kind of energy. So this to me is kind of the counterbalance of, restoring myself and replenishing myself and getting the magnetic field from the earth and the negative ions from the environment you know that's just it, you know it, it, it's 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 a very important kind of uh introverted thing i need to do when i do things extroverted in the world so um it's it's something that i'm almost I'm grateful for, but I'm also like, this is my medicine in order for me to function at a higher level in this world. So, you know, it's like, I don't know about you guys, but you know, when you kind of realize how you function and you, how you function at your best and always looking to make yourself better as a human being, mm -hmm. you also realize the things that work well for you and work well for me. And so, um, I'm fortunate to be able to find a place that, that, that can support a way of life that is not just getting by that can restore me and build me up so that I can continue to kind of drive my life in a way that contributes to life in a, in a bigger way. So that, that there's a lot of meanings behind me being on the land, but, um, that's some of them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we can, we both relate to that well being from South Africa, we grew up in the outdoors and, uh, you know, on sort of decent sizes of land as well. And there's just in South Africa, especially in the bush, there's just this 
soothing element and it just kind of brings you closer to nature and it just makes you feel more connected, which is super powerful. And especially like I said, in this day and age, so important. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I just had a quick question to Dan. Do you, do you manage to grow some of your own uh, veggies and things like that at home? Yeah. I mean, I, I did for a little while and, and now I'm still, honestly, I'm still trying to lay out how I want to roll some of that stuff out. Mm. I'm, I'm still kind of observing the, the ecosystem and where yeah. certain things, because I have some severe places where it gets really hot and then in the winter it gets really cold and these little mm. bowls. So, um, I was just t- talking to a buddy of mine, a permaculturist buddy of mine, and we were starting to figure out what plants could kind of get through some of those, uh, you know, people don't think of California as extreme, but there are some extreme kind of semi climates. And, um, so I haven't fully committed aside from Yay. a few plum trees and lemons and, and and there's some uh, uh, wild chanterelle mushrooms that are around that I forage and and stuff like that. But uh, and I've planted some some moringa uh, trees here, and they don't like the cold at all. Mm. So so I'll, I'll have to I'm gonna greenhouse some some areas off so that I can control mm. the atmosphere a little bit. But I haven't fully right now. I'm still kind of exploring what 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 this could be and uh going for the long haul of how to kind of set up this this land to thrive on itself uh as best as possible while planting some new things too love it i think it's uh it's actually a lot more difficult than people think it is to grow your own veggies and uh whatever fruits and things like that so there's there's so much more to it than just kind of sticking something in the ground yeah. and looking after it every now and then. <laughs> so, yeah. But once, once, yeah. Once you set it up though, it's fairly, you know, once you get it, yeah. uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, you just, it's just a habit that you have to find yourself into. And, and, you know, I, in my last place before I moved here, I had, uh, you know, raised beds and growing tons of stuff. Uh, and, you know, creating my own compost and things like that. So mm. I, I, I'm, I'm all for doing that. It's just a matter of, and like, I just don't have the time right now. I've been super busy. So, so I, I want to do it when I want to do it right. So that's, yeah. that's where I'm, where I'm at. I like the element that you bring there of, of sitting back as well and observing a little bit. I think that's really um, a, an important and smart element to that, you know, just, um, seeing what the land is like and understanding it before you just go, I'm going to do what I want. And, you know, so that's, right. that's a nice thing for, to learn from. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. And that's, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Darren. Um, I was, I was just going to sort of uh, lead into a question there. So um, you're a pretty Jack guy. I mean, you're, you're 48 years old, I think. And you, you mean you look super well and that's, I'm sure it's all down to the healthy lifestyle that you live. Um, you know, if we could just sort of like find out a little bit more about your story, I know that life actually began two years premature for you when, when you were first born and you kind of only were given a 50% chance of living. Um, yeah. 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 I was two and a half, two and a half months, two months premature. So I was three and a half pounds and, and, uh, that, um, uh, that certainly sent a signal of vulnerability uh, to me uh, and kind of realizing that as a kid, kind of having some weird anomaly issues uh, growing up from, you know, very over, overactive thyroid and underdeveloped lungs and, and, um, uh, some heart issues potentially and there's all in allergies and there was just a kind of a slew of things and um you know and that was the blessing too because that said i can't just sit back i need to actually do something and about it and and i think when i was 
you know, when I was 13, I kind of did my first cleanse and, and, you know, and, and this isn't, I didn't come from hippie parents. I didn't come from, you know, that kind of thing. I kind of did it on my own. And I, uh, realizing at 13 that by what I was putting in my body actually made me feel better. And it, uh, and it changed my, not only feeling, but also my brain and, uh, how I felt in, in my body and then picking up my first dumbbell at 16, uh, then realizing, Oh, you can shape your body. Uh, you can build it, you can build the strength. And, and I was really motivated because I didn't feel strong, uh, certainly at the first part of my life and, and throughout my childhood. So, so to be able to, start making the the connection between food and working out could then take me on a path of building my body so that I wouldn't have to be a kind of a victim of this vulnerable kind of chemistry set that we have for a body. Uh, that was incredible for me to start putting that together because that also came with that, the work ethic of, of doing those things because you guys both know uh, you don't show up to the gym and get stronger by walking in the door. You, <laughs> you, have, you have to pick up real iron and, and, and things and, and show up every day. And, and the same with food. Uh, you don't get healthy by doing whatever you want, putting in your mouth. Uh, you you uh, need to come at it with consciousness and awareness and, and direction and uh education and learning and vulnerability and that kind of thing and and so those that building block for me is is uh, you know from that first imprint uh informs me to this day so you know uh, if i'm out running around finding herbs and superfoods and and finding a health secret or or researching something it's all informed by way of not thinking I'm necessarily weak anymore, but I always want to optimize myself, but it's more of now, how can I continue to share this so that other people, if they're feeling a similar way of their bodies not being that strong, they're a victim to not feeling that great because of whatever situations going on in their life, that if what I can do uh, can aid in supporting people getting outside of themselves to uh, gain something for themselves to be stronger uh, and, and live a greater life. That's, that's my, that's my ultimate mission uh, and kind of informs everything I do. So um, it has to be good for people uh, in my pursuit and it has to be uh, beneficial to the planet. Uh, if it isn't, uh, it is motivated by something else and that something else is just not, is something that I've worked at not, uh, exercising. Um, meaning that I, I, I don't get motivated by pure money. I don't get motivated by, by, uh, uh, quick fixes on stuff. Uh, even though I have, and I've, lost things by it we all go through it uh but now at this point in my life um uh it's all motivated by kind of those fundamental principles of, of uh it sounds so cliche but it literally is doing good while doing good for the people and places and things and the planet around you and that's that's what I live. Those are the principles in, 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 that are integrated that I've worked very hard to integrate into my life um, because it feels so good. There's a selfishness to doing good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that selfishness is, is it feeds you just by the act alone, even before anything's manifested. It feeds you on a cellular level, on a molecular level, on a quantum physics level, on a harmonious uh, level, it feeds you directly just by that is what I desire to do and I'm gonna take action on. Just that start is already feeding you and then 
the continuous action of it continues to build on that. So therefore, I've come to this place where I, I don't desire to do anything outside of that because it just doesn't line up with who I am. So anyway, that's, uh, that's a bit of a tangent, but it, it, but, it, but it came by way of the hardships as a child. Um, and, and, and I very much, with the help of my father, kind of telling me the stories of, of seeing me as a child and, and hitting a wall and finding a way around it and him and my mom's love that supported me and they couldn't do anything with my struggle, but they could at least be there as I struggled and, and, and figured out a way around it. So that, that is, you know, fundamentally at the core of me now and, and, informed by you know the reflection of my of certainly my father um and now i've been able to fully embrace the past embrace the hardship uh and embrace the opportunity and the huge blessing that all of that was so that i can now be focused and clear and the, the thing that's cool about clarity and kind of embodiment of that and awareness is that it also eliminates more and more distraction. So there's just certain things I just, I'm not interested in doing, right? And so, uh, because it doesn't line up with what I want in my life. And some people could look at that as like, oh, that's boring or, you're not living, but I'm living for a much different purpose for me. So, so anyway, I hope that makes sense. You know, that, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. You, you mentioned quite a few things, obviously, that are really interesting to us. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to come back to um, your, your parents and your dad specifically. And, but I'd also like to just ask, you were saying you're helping others with their journey because you obviously are feeling good at this stage in your life. Um, do you feel that most people are actually living a sort of a, a version of themselves that they don't even realize could be better? And, and so just through education, it's just, you know, try something and you, you might actually feel like a different person. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's almost like you don't know what you don't know if mm. you don't know it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like uh, people people seem to be okay with whatever it is that they think they are supposed to be okay with, and and uh, and it's that whole thing of we all want our friends and family to kind of have a secure life and be and have you know enough money and enough you know a house and a thing and all of that stuff but that's a slippery slope too. And, um, I think, I think you need to have a splash of risk, but you also, that risk is, is generated, I believe, uh, through your desire to, to exercise the purpose and the passion that is deep within you. And, and no one can tell you what that is. No one can tell you what job is good for you. No one can tell you how to live your life. The, the, the only way, from my humble opinion, the only way you can really figure that out is that's, it's almost like learning a language because we're kind of blasted in this body and we're on this planet going 263,000 miles an hour. Uh, and, and, you, you're not given this manual, but this manual is given to you upon your willingness to receive mm. the information that's around you. But the only way to really receive that is to stop and, and settle in inside yourself. And this, this world is so loud with distraction and it's so riddled with people thinking they know what you should do. 
and it's easily blown off that voice that is yours and that voice saying, and that voice often is whispering saying, Hey, you really want to do this or what about this or try this. And, and it's easy to blow that off. And, and the more you say yes to that, the louder that will get. And it's almost like its own muscle. And, and so for whatever reason, and for, for the struggles I've had throughout my life, every struggle, I always have eventually in a roundabout way, come back to that, which is what am I here for? Who am I? What do I desire to create, generate in this life? And, uh, what can I do to get there? Uh, and that informs my everyday kind of start. I start every day that way. And, and, uh, and I think going back to some of what you're saying, it's like, I, I, I get it that sometimes we need a timeout. This, this world is hard and it's, there's difficulty and there's challenges and you can't judge another person's process or when they're going to get wherever they're going. Um, but I think through all of it, it's developing that, that inner muscle of the willingness to listen to the language that's being spoken directly to you as you for you from whatever this great mystery is. Um, and, and, and I think that once that's informed, I think life changes and I think it, it creates not only, I was telling you before, not only the path that it opens up in front of you, but the feeling it gives you in the moment, in the microscopic second that you say yes to it. Um, and then it changes the magnetic field, the physical magnetic field around you to generate that and, and create and pull into your life that which you're now clear on. So, you know, this is a much, this is a big conversation, but, but, it, but it's, it, but it's important because there's so many people that, you know, call it sleep, call it unwillingness, call it pain and suffering, call it whatever you want. But, um, that's life. That's humanness. Just because I just said that, just because I do that, that doesn't mean I'm without pain, without anger, without mm. sadness, without struggle, without all of it, a hundred percent. But it's the going back to the place that you have found that is you, that is beyond the distractions, beyond this kind of physical reality that can then use and find the opportunity of the struggle and the pain and the anger and the fear and then continue to go back and maybe get off of it that much quicker and, and or maybe find the blessing or the opportunity in that much quicker. So, so it's not that I think I have the answer. It's that we all have it. And for whatever reason, I believe for me, uh, by always going back to the quiet, to the center, why I live under the trees, uh, is because I don't want to be distracted and think that my purpose is from the distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to calm down, slow down, go inside every day to make sure that the path I'm leading is the path from within myself. And it is pure as much as I know at that time uh, to contribute to a life that I can be proud of when I'm 110 uh, and, and my final look over the mountain and I'm ready to just jump off. You know, I, I just, you know, it, it's that whole thing of like, you know, birthdays and um, New Year's resolutions. I kind of, I think you should, we should take that on every day. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's a that's a massive tangent. Didn't know we were getting into it, but um, it's beautiful, and it's mm -hmm. and the willingness to take that on is often difficult too, because mm -hmm. you have to face the bullshit you've been telling yourself. So mm -hmm. you know, if I'm running around going, "I'm Darren and I'm great and I'm just Darren," I'm fucked. Yeah. You know, I'm. I'm gonna, uh, the universe is going to slap the shit out of me because I'm not <laughs> just that. 
right? I'm not just a superfood hunter. I'm not just the son of my father. I'm not just the son of my mother. I'm not just this thing. I'm a infinite being having a hell of an experience. And by just taking that effort on, you kind of have to face the fear. You kind of have to face the inherent human fear that we have of this ridiculously vulnerable life that if I go outside and I, a mountain lion comes, he can rip my arm off. Like <laughs> that's, that's some shit, bro. Like that's, that, that this reality is full of that. We just, you know, that, that, that rapper that just died, that young 23 year old kid, Mac something, uh, just passed away from a drug overdose. Like it's happening all around us, all of this shit all the time. And, and, you know, that's where I'm just like, I would rather at least participate in the, in the contribution of what I desire my life to be than being yanked around by some other weird intention um, from a life that's gnarly enough. Um, so beautiful wow oh, that's Be totally beautiful right that's a podcast over uh, yeah, you know was, uh, given all our value you there you can't take a, it from there can you yeah i know exactly <laughs> i mean every, everything you're saying is literally right up like you know our alley like craig and i talk about this stuff all the time and you know we we're even talking this week about like how precious life is and it's literally on you know, it, it's, you're just so fortunate to be alive because anything can happen in, in an instant and take it away, you know, and it's yeah. just people, people maybe don't, don't realize that and they don't live like that, which is, you know, like you said, every day must be a birthday. It's so important. So yeah. how, how do you, how do you try and live in the present more? Do you do like, you know, the, the kind of things people are doing more of these days, like meditation and mindfulness, or do you have any other special ways that you kind of get into the present moment? Yeah, several. I think every morning I start with uh, breath work. Uh, uh, Patrick McEwen's, uh, I do a lot of nose breathing. Obviously, uh, Wim Hof is a friend. I've known him. I've done a bunch of that stuff. Uh, so breath work is a great way to just shut down the monkey mind uh, and turn it off for a bit. Uh, and then I always do kind of stream of consciousness journaling uh, where I go right from the meditation, the breathing uh, into uh, a kind of that, that, that now a little more integrated into this world of, of what am I thinking? What am I perceiving? What am I, what is my, consciousness desiring my spirit desiring to talk about to share and then inevitably it kind of comes into business and steps that i can take and people to connect with and so then it kind of becomes more of this reality and then you know getting outside uh i get outside a lot uh my dog is a great presence in my life to um to always you know, it's funny because he'll give me a certain amount of time and then he'll require me to kind of get out and not be behind the computer. And he kind of picks up on it. Um, and so being present with him and, and I think children are a certain sense that way that he, like you have to focus on, you can't just be here and spinning out and ruminating and stressing that you have other things and other people that depend on you. And, um, that's a beautiful mindful, uh, thing. And I have a group, great group of kind of misfits that I've worked out with for a decade, uh, <laughs> you know, from, from accomplished people, uh, who, who we kind of leave all that shit at the door and, uh, we don't really care what they've done from being an athlete to an actor to extreme sport person, it doesn't matter. It's really kind of what you bring showing up for the group with the group and, you know, going into exercise, going into breathing, going into, you know, talking about life and supporting each other. So those things are wonderful in the sense that there's a huge contribution to my life and, um, and then I have to say all the projects that I'm involved with are very, 
now um, uh, have some incredible partners and partnerships and friends that that are holding the space of of the meaning behind these projects and 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 that's a very special thing I'm meeting more and more people with more and more projects that are that are resonating with a bigger purpose in mind with the reality that you have to make this into business that's sustainable and people have to make money and, and time is worth something. And it's all of that um, too, but, but it seems that that is, a, is, is lending itself to being less distractive and more mindful, even in my business development stuff. And um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant evolution too, um, to, to, to generate the mindfulness in every day. Um, and to see the most interesting is to see where the motivations are coming from. Um, I just did a brain map with a functional medicine doctor, buddy of mine and, and looking at the whole, vulnerabilities of what's going on in the brain how the brains from left and right to traumas to old injuries to alpha theta gamma delta and how it's flipping around and when do those come up and when do those uh, fire up and what's not working and what is working it's like i mean that's kind of life it's like sometimes <laughs> it feels good and it flows and other times <laughs> the shit goes sideways yeah. and now and now what so yeah it's wild it's amazing how much synchronicity uh, there is in life i mean we always notice it but just in the stuff you've been talking about it's so much um in our reality and gareth and myself's reality at the moment uh, hey gareth i think you'd probably agree with it and it's just um like you said you just end up resonating with with people along that journey that uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, it always fascinates me to, to hear someone speak the stuff you're speaking about. It's like literally the stuff that's going on in our, in our lives across the world, somewhere else. And, and I guess that's, that's what the amazing thing is about the, hearing other people's stories. You realize it's not all that different, uh, to yourself, your own journey, you know, and, and so it's really wonderful. So, um, just bring it back, you know, you've obviously, you've had such interesting experiences in your life and, and, you know, things have shaped you uh, to become the man that you are. Um, one of them was uh, your dad used to drink quite a lot when from a young age. And, and did that influence, uh, did that influence you? And, and then he actually stopped uh, drinking uh, when you were a youngster and, and why did he stop? And was there an impetus for that? <laughs> uh yeah so at four at four years old um i believe the story is that he didn't know i was sitting on a little stoop into the garage and he slammed the door and it and he was drunk and it threw me so I was sitting on the stoop and he slammed the door and the door hit me and threw me into a sea of beer bottles on a concrete oh. floor. And it, I don't know if, you know, there's a scar on my chin that yeah. as a four year old, I had there 22 stitches. So my, my chin was kind of hanging off Jesus. and my dad uh, drove me, of course he was drunk he drove me to the hospital holding my chin on. Uh, and it was from his, from his, uh, from what he told me that was when he got sober for the, for the first time. And, and so, you know, he went to rehab, but th that rehab back in the day, they de dealt with none of the psychological stuff. They just basically pinned you down on a table and made you shake your way through mm. the, the, the physicality of the addiction. Um, so my dad was an angry bastard, right? He was just, he, he was just, uh, he was a beautiful, beautiful person um, and struggled with, I think it was about seven years old where I asked him, don't ask me where this came from, but 
I asked him one day, uh, what did he want in his life? And I was seven and he just said, Hey, I want to get on the water and I want to be free. I want to ride my motorcycle. I want to get a motorcycle and ride and feel the wind on my face and, 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 you know, move out of Minnesota and be in the sunshine and all that stuff. And did he do that? No, he never, he, well, he did end up buying a motorcycle because I bought one later when I was 21 years old. And then he, uh, he bought one and had it for a period of time. And then, uh, for weird reasons, he got rid of it. But so he struggled with this idea of what he should do and who he actually is. And he was this wide open, big spirited, outside of the box thinking, really bright, very perceptive, incredibly emp empathetic person. But yet he was a professor. And the cool thing is he's a professor at the University of Minnesota. He was an agriculture professor. So it was cool. Like he he had a lot out of sharing and interacting with, with students and stuff, but he never fully gave himself the permission to live the life he wanted. Um, and then he got divorced from my mom when I was 18. Uh, and I actually, after a little period of time, I celebrated that because I also saw how difficult they were having it for 21 years. And, and uh, I saw them both blossom and I saw more of my dad come out. Uh, he got remarried. Uh, and then it was really at the, at the, the turning point of him having uh, two new kids and a new marriage uh well the marriage was fairly it was wasn't necessarily new anymore but the kids were born and um a half brother and sister and and, and i think just the pressure of that and you know and that not really getting out of the cold tundra of minnesota i think it just kind of hit him and mm -hmm. so he started drinking again uh and that that was gnarly uh, and he couldn't stop. And so r really seeing the, the growing up into the after effect of not taking care of the emotional side of addiction, I lived with that. Um, and then really seeing someone struggle with straight on addiction. Um, and my dad and I were extremely co close when I was uh, an adult. And so I could openly and honestly talk to him about everything and about how this made me feel and how he was feeling with this struggle. And, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the vulnerability that we both had and uh, he didn't make it through it. So he passed away in 2005 and, and um, the, to this date, the, the hardest thing in my life, uh, but there's something that was something that I would never allow myself to do. And that isn't to take that energy that I feel like we shared in a certain sense of that freedom and that willingness to think differently and, 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 and at least put the foot forward into the life that you, you feel like you want to live. Um, that I, I was already starting to feel that way and him and I would talk about it, but the moment he passed away was the moment the, the any, any, uh, any uncertainty had left me at that point. And I, that's when I got into superfood hunting and that's where I got into, okay, own who I am, own what I like to do and, 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 and put it in motion. No more fucking around, no more wasting time, no more contemplating whether it's going to work or not. Just go do it. Um, and it was that kind of spirit that took charge after my father died that, that will never leave me uh, ever. And, you know, that, that human being that was my dad and it's and it's just incredible to even in this moment to feel that because i can't i can't really put into words 
how powerful that is to me. And, and so that, that someone who struggles in life and someone like myself who struggled in life, um, it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary for him to, to struggle. Uh, and, you know, going back to what we said to, to all of us, this is our life. And if we don't take it seriously, then, and I don't mean serious, like don't have fun. I mean, serious in the sense that this is your life, go live it. Uh, then I don't know what needs to happen for someone to get that. But um, I want to be on the right side of my life and, and certainly the life that my dad didn't fully embrace to at least give it a hell of a go to create and generate the life that's going to contribute to me and make me feel good and also as many people as possible so anyway that's yeah 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 that's i mean that in in that's such a sad story but at the same way it's it's a real beautiful story and it's beautiful that you guys got to spend that good period together too. Um, it's also, it's sad, you know, that it takes events like that for us to sort of kick in to, to changing our ways. Um, it actually reminds me of a book I read many years ago called Tuesdays with Mori. And wow, one of the most amazing books I've ever read, you know, and um, yeah. there's, there's so many lessons to be learned from like older people and people that are closer with us. Um, sorry, close to us. So, yeah, but thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, man. I can feel that was like heartfelt. Um, just, uh, I mean, another thing that's, that sort of helped you on your path and sent you on the sort of healthier, even healthier than you were way that, that you are now was a college football injury. And you were kind of, I don't know what the exact story was, but you were kind of a bit frustrated with Western medicine and you're like, <laughs> screw this stuff, it's not going to work. And you went and you sort of explored your own ways and sort of how to get better, uh, which is really, really interesting. Do you just want to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's funny because, you know, the from the the beginning part of my life and struggling through like even a senior in high school, I had a, I had my senior year, I had our biggest guy who's 350 pounds fall on my ankle and I couldn't even play the rest of that season. Uh, so then I still had this part of me that wanted to play. So a couple of colleges was looking at me and, and enough to, to be able to walk on. And so when I started college I still had this big part of me that wanted to play football and and because of my senior year in high school didn't really pan out so well so um, my freshman year I showed up I was a, a behind a senior running back um, didn't play a lot the first season so sophomore year I'm starting uh, and god damn it I my first first game uh, of the season as a starter, uh, I just crunched my back and I didn't really know it until the end. I knew the hit was big, but I didn't, I didn't know that it affected me as much as it did. And then at the end of the game, everything started seizing up and my back kind of froze and I tore a bunch of ligaments in my lower back and it created such an instability in my lower back that I couldn't the regular wasn't like a broken bone where you just kind of immobilize it, let it heal and come. It was like this very intricate, you know, uh, uh, ligament structure in the sacral area that uh, created a massive instability in my whole trunk. And so I couldn't, I got frustrated by, you know, all the MRIs and all of the people and all the poking and all the prodding and all that stuff. And I finally, through the depression of realizing I'm not going to play, I'm not going to play anymore. And, and pissed off that, 
that this regular, the best care wasn't getting me on that field and wasn't getting me back again. So I changed my major to exercise phys, exercise physiology and nutrition and kinesiology and all of that shit. Um, really out of my own necessity. Um, and then, of course, that necessity turned into a fascination of, and I definitely wasn't the smartest in the class. I definitely, you know, the science was difficult. It's like, but, but there was this through line of like, holy shit, this is a miracle. Like the, the way the body works and the way it interacts and the way it can convert food to energy and uh you know and the zillion processes that are going on every second uh and then all this coming back to the food you take in the water you drink um that all just turned turned me into this fascinated uh human being and and the more i kind of looked at the supplement world and the food world the more i kept seeing then uh, things not being done very well. Uh, and, and from that journey, um, I eventually started formulating with certain herbs and botanicals. And I had some doctors come over who used to go to the, uh, Uni university of Colorado. I was living in Colorado and they used to go to the, uh, CU university medical library and drop off all these, uh, papers on, functional medicine back in the day the, the herbs and the things and so i was starting to being prepared for things that i didn't even know i was going to be doing uh, and uh and then eventually um it was really i was playing around with all that i was playing around with formulas and then cut to 2005 when my father passed away then i took what I was learning and thought I was just playing around and then just said, I got to do this because I'm seeing things no one else is seeing. I'm finding botanicals no one else was finding in the sense that they weren't using it or they weren't using it effectively or, uh, and that's, that's, that's what turned into my, my career. Uh, and you know, and, and now it's still, obviously in the herbal world and superfood world, but it's also now in, you know, different parts of healthcare and uh, different aspects uh, because it's just, it's all intersected and all contributes. So, yeah. Isn't that interesting how once again, you hear that something that may come across as a really negative event in one's life, can actually totally change your trajectory to something where it's now elevated you to places that you probably had never uh, imagined at the time. You know what I mean? So it's, oh, it's actually yeah, really, really amazing. So you spoke about your career uh, as it, as it stands and um, tell us a little bit more about Shakeology because that's kind of where things also took off a little bit for you. If I, if I'm not mistaken, which you yeah. created for uh, Beach Body, uh, yeah. How did that um, progress and come about? Yeah, so I think make I made the choice first uh, in two thousand four. Two thousand two thousand four, I was starting to travel, but two thousand five, I after my dad died, I created a a business structure, and I was like, I'm going to do it. And so the next year, I was traveling and investigating stuff and I had formulas I was going to put out in the world and burning through all my money and <laughs> trying to be an entrepreneurial person. And then kind of in that, in that throw of doing it, um, I got approached by Beachbody kind of serendipitously because I was kind of poaching a guy from a local uh, uh, vitamin shop here in Malibu. And, uh, he had, he was kind of outside of the box, but he was a manager of this vitamin barn and, uh, we just resonated and he was this native American Mexican coming from some generations of his grandmother teaching him plant medicines and all of this stuff. So, so I said, listen, you're amazing. 
Um, I, this is what I'm doing. I'm connecting to people around the globe. I'm finding these underutilized plants. I'm putting formulas together. Let's do this. And he was like, I'm in. In that process, he was still, you know, working until we really took off. He ran into the, the girlfriend and now the wife of the owner of Beachbody. And they got into the conversation and they, Beachbody and Carl was the owner, was considering doing a, 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 a better uh, product line that could match their, their kind of exercise world. And uh, so she was a great uh, formulator herself and educated person. Uh, we, we met uh, through the introduction from Miguel. And uh, as soon as I met her, we were like on the same page and she goes, I need help with this thing. Uh, my husband wants to create this. We saw what you get, you're doing with these superfoods. Could you make this superfood shake for us? And, uh, and I met with Carl and I believed what he wanted to do in terms of affecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people's lives with good nutrient dense foods. And he said, do it the right way and let me figure out how to sell it. And I was like, and then he made a promise. I'm not going to ever, I'm not going to ever change the formula to make it less effective or make to make money. I will mm -hmm. always, I will always improve it. And, uh, because of that, I believed him. And so I started to formulate it in 2006, got done in 2008. Um, had several relationships already with some of the farmers and suppliers and things like that. So uh, that launched and, um, you know, I was a part of it. Um, not an employee of Beachbody, but certainly endorsing the very product that I put together. And uh, it became their biggest selling product by a big amount. Uh, and I think it, 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 came to one year uh half to three quarters of a billion dollars i think wow uh, um so so that you know again i didn't do any of it for the money the money came and it was awesome uh i mean i certainly didn't make that that money but uh i made enough to continue my mission um and I continued to travel. I continued to work with indigenous people. I continued to look for more. I continued to play with new formulas. I since created a few more formulas for them, uh, have a great relationship with them. And then, you know, I continue, I continue, I continue. I dig into research. I dig into water stuff. I dig into uh, how superfoods are inter interacting with certain situations. Uh, and then, and then of course the Baruka thing came, the Baru nuts, and I wrestled that away, saying to Beachbody, "I need to take this one to the market because this is ridiculous." Um, so, so yeah, so now uh, that that's that's the that's the Shakeology story. I can't even believe now that it's, you know, that was two thousand six. It's bloody close it's you know we're approaching 2019 it's crazy it's yeah it is crazy darren you live like a super healthy lifestyle and i'm sure you everything you eat is like very natural very wholesome uh, i know you live a vegan lifestyle and but what are your thoughts on supplementation i guess you kind of you've created one now and a few now i mean they a lot of them are full of rubbish, right? How, how, how do we know which ones to trust? Because for most people, they, they kind of, they have no clue, uh, but, but they, these companies have insane marketing um, strategies and, and budgets. How do we know which ones to use? And like, yeah. Uh, well, the, my first answer is I have no idea. Uh, and that's the scary thing. Um, understand that my most of my career has been behind the scenes so most of my career has been working seeing hundreds and hundreds of production 
facilities meeting thousands and thousands of farmers around the world, knowing what's good practice and knowing what's really bad practice and knowing where some of, and if not most of some of the supply of some said botanical or superfood, knowing where some of that originates from, it is a very, it's wild west, man. And you're right. There's, there's, there's slick marketing campaigns. And I think, I think several things go on. I think number one, companies don't have, don't have the money to fully vet these situations. They're, they're trusting a supplier and that supplier could be, you know, having hundreds and hundreds of ingredients that they're, they're just procuring around the world and they're a broker and they're doing the best they can. And, do they actually know the farmers? No. Do they actually know the botanical? No. Do they actually know what the active compounds should be and at what quantities? Not necessarily. So, you know, with demand, you get floods of, of ingredients and those ingredients, unfortunately, go down in quality over time and over the saturation in the marketplace. So, uh, it, it, it's as a customer, if I didn't, if as a customer, if I knew what I knew, it would be very difficult for me to trust companies. Unfortunately, I actually know owners of companies. I know suppliers. I know where this thing, and as certainly from Beachbody standpoint, I mean, they, they back up what I say in terms of now what I'm talking about. And we spend millions of dollars a year with our team of people going around the globe on their hands and knees, checking out processing, checking out how things are grown, how it's processed and quality assurance and the modern day issues of heavy metal contaminations and microbiological contaminations. And most companies are not going to spend the millions of dollars, nor do they even have it. So they have to rely on these brokerage situations where they're just doing the bare minimal testing. And you have things like, you know, for example, like this drink that I'm drinking, this is pure Camu Camu berry from the Amazon. Hmm. It's the hmm. only time it's pure. Like I happen to know the guy who's been working there for 30 years. So this is frozen to my doorstep. Now <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking at it from how to work into that as a functional situation later. But Camu Camu, you can only get it in a powdered form. So obviously you have to dry it, pulverize it, collect it. And there's a million things that can go wrong in that process, but ultimately just shows up in a bag and, and you hope that it's just like the other one that's trying to market to you. And, mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I don't have an easy answer for this. I, the, I think the only thing you can do is as a customer, ask questions. Um, you know, the good news is that at least from the customers at Beachbody, they have an opportunity to talk to me. Like, so I do, I do podcasts for that, for that company all the time where I go through questions and I'm like, well, how many companies do you get to talk to the person who is in the field who uh, formulated the product and and is is supportive and and is aware of the high quality standards that go into it. So uh, aside from that, I don't have a good answer. Like there's certain companies that I again I know, and and these owners are doing the right things and there is vertical integration and the customers are demanding more transparency, more knowledge of where stuff's coming from. I think all of that trend is fantastic. Um, you, unfortunately, you just can't trust many companies. So you have to get recommendations through maybe influencers or people that have asked the tough questions or, you know, and, and that's the world we're living in. Um, you can't take even Beachbody. Like, uh, I'm not 
I'm not saying that they, they're definitely not doing everything perfectly to get the, the, the information out. I mean, I just met someone the other day who just thought Beachbody's Shakeology was just this fancy dancy meal replacement that uh, how could Beachbody create a high quality product? And so when they realized I did it and I was sitting right across from them, then they started asking me questions and I could tell them and they're like, I would have had no idea that that was occurring in this product. Mm. And I'm like, so there, therein lies an issue too, right? Yeah. So, so you have someone that I'm ridiculously passionate about. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fully involved and yet people still don't know the, 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 the depth and the breadth of these things. So, you know, uh, again, I think over time, we have to observe these companies. We have to ask the questions. And you're also putting companies in challenging situations. It's not like they can fully open up their everything because there's liabilities within every aspect. And, and, and there's a lot of people. There's Prop 65 here in California that is largely going after. It's, it's, it's supposedly good in terms of trying to control heavy metals, but... It's also just going after people that are still controlling uh, contaminants and things like that, but but uh, largely becomes an an unfair uh, situation where uh, just by way of of naturally growing things, you're going to accumulate um, uh, high amounts of uh, all kinds of constituents. So. Uh, th th there's a lot, there's a lot to look into and there's a lot to follow up on. And there's a lot of consumer, uh, uh, demand that I think is going in the right direction. And, and hopefully over time, a lot of these people just bubble up, it bubble, things bubble up to the surface and have a way of working themselves out. Uh, it's just that people, people spend their hard earned money on things and they don't, uh, they may not be getting the plant medicines uh, in a way that's actually going to move the needle in the overall pursuit of their optimal health. And that's where I want to continue to support that mission of, of getting high quality nutrients to people in that way. So, you know, the beginning of your question was like supplementation. Uh, number one, we kind of have to supplement uh because we're we're in a modern day uh extreme and that modern day extreme is our food is definitely not at the capacity nutrient wise that it needs to be um definitely grow your own food whenever possible but we're also having things rain down on us uh in our rain rain water and our surface water and our surface uh, we have modern day contaminants. So you're not also free of everything either if you just grow your own food. So you have on one hand, you have a, 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 a soup that's gathering, that's environmental stressors of our modern day world. And then at the same time, you have food that's nutrient starved or depleted. And so those two things living together of having a body getting more stressed and a body getting less nutrients is a prescription for disaster because the body ends up losing and then chronic disease or things end up showing up uh, or suffering shows up because of that stuff. So what I interject is that's why I think the part of the understanding is, is, is nutrient density. So the, every bite you take, try to make it, uh, is as impactful as possible while enjoying your life. Um, but, you know, there's, and, and with that, there's several foundational things that we need to take into consideration too. And from sunlight to sleep to water um, and, and, and that kind of thing. But, but yeah, we're, we're, you know, and the, and the really, the only way you're really going to know if you need something and deficiencies, you need to get, like you need to see inside your body in terms of getting some tests done um, and things like that. So, mm. yeah. yeah. That's a 
it's a, it's a it's a massive industry and it's a massive complicated like you said chemistry is complicated and how do you look into the product now I, off the back of gareth's question there darren um tell us a little bit about superfoods now it's a little bit a uh, little bit controversial because in in my opinion is is that you know people are like well food food is food some things you eat more of are good for you than others perhaps but what is a superfood in, in your mind and what what makes it a superfood yeah that's a great question it's something it's very a nebulous kind of definition but really it's it's a superfood is per calorie having a nutrient density greater than something that that is uh, having a same calorie output. So, uh, you know, for, you can look at it from a macro perspective. You know, something may have carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, but but what is it giving you on a cellular level? Is it is it does it is it having calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, iodine, co- copper? Uh, is, is it having antioxidants? Is it having uh, phytonutrients and flavonoids and compounds and constituents that can contribute to your life? Or is it uh, a calorie that is largely void of many of the micronutrients and, and, and just kind of filling up space uh, mm-hmm. within that bite? Um, so really, uh, you could make the argument that uh, I could have one apple and then I could have a super apple of uh, a really controlled microorganisms of the soil, a really great environment where that's, that apple has maybe even grown in the wild. And that apple uh, maybe has even been put under stress from its environment, and therefore creating even uh, adapted, uh, adaptogenic aspects for that that apple to survive quote unquote in the wild therefore having higher constituents Mm. of 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 uh vitamin c vitamin a the antioxidants all of that stuff because it's kind of on its own surviving as opposed to a monocropped uh conventionally grown uh maybe you know pesticide ridden uh perfect road uh, trees that are producing apples and you hold them up and they might kind of look the same, but then the density and the, the wildness and the constituents that's in this apple, you can make the argument, Oh, that's a superfood. That's a, you know what I mean? And then of course the extremes are, uh, you know, a handful of goji berries at at 50 calories and a bite of a donut at 50 calories well the bite of the donut is definitely not a superfood (laughs) but the but the handful of goji berries is definitely a superfood so so it's it's a little nebulous in terms Mm -hmm. of that but but it's really again uh taking the 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 aspect of eat whole fresh a lot of plants a lot of food that has that it, that at least has a if it's not directly from the ground uh, or the tree or the plant, uh, you at least know uh, where where it's from so that it can harness the, the, the what it's kind of designed to deliver to you. So so anyway, that's kind of a you know a roundabout. Yeah, for sure. Because because I often think people think it's only like one particular type of thing. Like it has to be this sort of berry or whatever is a superfood. But you know, some broccoli, for example. You know, we can all, we can sort of categorize that almost. I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Well, you can you can certainly say you know in that sense you can say well if I were to hold up broccoli and or broccoli sprouts. Mm, okay. Broccoli sprouts are close to 10 times the nutrients of the broccoli itself yeah so so then you could make the argument like okay is broccoli technically a superfood sure but is broccoli sprouts infinitely more (laughs) valuable yes so and it's very easy to grow broccoli sprouts get sprouting broccoli seeds uh expose them to water a couple times a day let them receive some light. And in a few days, you're going to have tons of broccoli sprouts you can add to anything and you're getting 
a nutrient density uh, that is su superior to many things, an anti-cancer, sulforaphane, and all of these other things. So, um, so yeah, you can kind of go down the list that way. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you could even make a superfood donut to make a like a high <laughs> nutri nutrient dense donut. I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? So maybe that's your business that you're not telling us about, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about, talking about, um, you know, nutrient dense foods and business, your latest venture is a really, really interesting one. You found the Baru nuts in Brazil and that's you you are saying is the most uh, nutritionally dense nut there is in the world um so I guess far. A, a, a couple of questions like how did you find these and can you just maybe tell us a little bit more about the nut please? yeah well i wasn't looking uh i was looking for other things uh i was in the uh, in Belém, at least in the mouth of the Amazon, and then into the Amazon on the other side of Brazil, in the, in the eastern side of Brazil. And upon coming back, and you know, a few pictures on social media and whatnot, upon coming back, I had a Brazilian reach out to me uh, and tell me about uh, the Barrozeira tree and uh, tell me about the nut. And so he sent me samples, he sent me the research, and then quickly I was like, holy shit, this is not only from a taste perspective, from a nutrient perspective, and also uh, this potentially has a uh, environmental uh, need. Uh, so I quickly just, you know, we kind of met and we were like, okay, well, the only way to truly know if this is even possible, I got to get on a plane. So we went to Brazil and uh, went to this amazing place called the Sahadu, which is the savannah of Brazil. It's like the cousin of the Amazon and the, on the southern, southern border of the Amazon, a massive, massive area of Brazil, a uh, third of Brazil, right? Three, three states of the U S Texas. So it's like a third of the United States. Wow. Um, it's huge. And, and so, and it's the, and it's the fastest, uh, it's being destroyed faster than any biome on the planet that we know of right now. That's so, tragic. yeah. So it's this beautiful, beautiful, very unique, uh, biodiverse area that looks nothing like the Amazon that looks more of like this arid kind of planet um, with these trees and some uh, palm fruits and all kinds of different things and and with some deep tap roots that that allow it to tap into the aquifer below but because uh, it's not high vegetation. It's fairly low with deep tap roots. They, they wipe it out pretty quickly. And Brazil is such an aggressive country in terms of cattle grazing, uh, food production for cattle and actual cattle itself, um, that uh, it's being lost to that unsustainable practice. So uh, the Barrozeta tree is a, an endemic, important tree to that area. And so we quickly realized, A, this is a huge area. Uh, it is definitely possible as a business. Uh, there's some things we need to work out in terms of processing uh, because people are cracking this with a machete in the field and uh, it's a very hard shell. And then inside that shell, uh, there's a nut, one nut per shell, and there's a light wow. fruit layer on the outside. So you have to whack that shell really hard to, to get one nut. Um, so, so although it falls naturally to the ground because you can't pick it, you have to let it fall because the nut's not mature until it actually falls. Um, wow. This quickly became something we need to look into so the indigenous people aren't having to do crazy labor to, to do that. So we started employing 
engineers to figure out ways to better crack it, to which we, we have found several ways to do that now. Um, not easy. Um, but then we realized that tens of thousands of indigenous people uh, require some sort of income from their land. And, and this has largely been unsuccessful, even, in, even within the country of Brazil itself, because they haven't understood the business of it enough and the economy of, of scaling this and, and, and figuring out ways to collect these nuts when you're having tens of thousands of families around the landmass that's that size. It's a very difficult process. So we're three years in of, of figuring out all the logistical nightmares. Uh, but now we're pretty solid and we're, as we speak now, I don't know when this airs, but as we're recording this, we're, we're amassing huge amounts of a collection because you're only collecting once a year. And so the bottom line is once I went out and saw the, the need for the land itself to be valuable in a different way, indigenously, endemically, that this was a great way to preserve this incredible biome that has more plants than, than, than people know of. Uh, uh, thousands of indigenous plants that people have never even seen, uh, that we can create value for those indigenous people so they're less likely to uh, allow for cattle farmers and, uh, and all of these things to come in and, 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 and strip that land. Uh, so that became a, a, a high priority for us. And, uh, and then obviously, as you know now, my mission is to get nutrient density to people so that they can have a great life. And then seeing the nutritionals and having tested all of that stuff, I was just like, and how the hell can it taste that good? Mm -hmm. um, it lined up in four major categories, which is very rare. So uh, nutritionally, uh, it was superior. Taste-wise, it didn't have a barrier for the American and certainly the, 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 the westernized palate, right? So nutritionally superior, uh, taste was superior, uh, environmentally, it was very important because our goal now is to plant 20 million new Bidrosata trees and then uh, indigenously to support directly the indigenous people themselves to have a fair uh, uh, traded uh, wild collected food that they can rely on for the next 10 or 20 years that, that we've set our agreements up as so that became that became the Barucas project that became the and and I got an amazing team together uh, and we're all dialed in to the big picture uh, and, and 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 you know it's one of my greatest things ever to be able to reach out to a friend and say hey have these nuts uh, and you're gonna love them and they do uh, they fall in love with them, they eat them, they buy them, and it supports this whole chain. And that, to me, is one of the greatest gifts of, of, of truly vertically integrated, good for the people, good for the planet mission. Um, but it takes work, it takes time, it takes money, uh, and that's what we've you know, committed ourselves to do. I really want to taste one of those nuts now <laughs> how do we get hold yeah, of them oh yeah we'll we'll just uh, make sure to send me your address or i'll send you a bunch for sure oh, brilliant. but but as a as a consumer though in general oh uh, yeah, yeah. How, how yeah. Can you <laughs> thank you though yeah, <laughs> yeah i probably can't do that for everyone but uh, <laughs> uh, so just here. <laughs> yeah so barucas.com b-a-r-u-k-a-s.com and then we're on amazon and if you have a lot of international people, we're doing what we can to roll out the other countries. It takes, it takes a bit of time to, to do mm -hmm. that. So we apologize if it doesn't get to every country at this point. Uh, but that is our mission to make this an international uh, uh, celebrated uh, food. So that, that's, an, that's an incredible like story. And mm -hmm. the Craig and I were talking about this uh, before we were like, 
it's it's a bit of a like a challenge you know you you to try and find a nuts or any sort of food that is super amazing right it's like indigenous to somewhere and to make a business out of that that doesn't actually harm mm. the sort of local people do you know what i mean and the environment i mean it, it sounds like those are obviously your values yeah. but it's it's still like it's still hard to do that hey very difficult. And I think if it wasn't, you know, 15 years of experience and then also uh, 30 years of experience of, of my other buddy who's traveled with me and understands uh, food systems on big levels and, and, uh, and then my other, uh, our other CEO, Rod, uh, CEO Rodrigo and all these, all these people that are understanding that, um, it would be difficult to bring someone who didn't understand that into the fold because you're, 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 you're having to suspend profit uh, while you're building a foundation. And before you even build that, you have to understand hundreds and hundreds of hours on the ground and, and talking to the chiefs, to the heads mm -hmm. of the villagers, the heads of the community, uh, researchers at universities who study the tree and the fruit and the nut, um, and 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 all the experts in the botany field and ethnobotany in the area. I mean, we've interviewed everybody so that we have a really good sense of what the truth is around it, and. Very, very few companies will do that amount of uh, on the ground, uh, non sexy, uh, you know, just doling out money just to figure out if you even can do it. So, mm. uh, so, so it, 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 it takes for even for me to even be able to tell you all of that is hundreds and hundreds of hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we've had to spend before we were even selling a nut. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's the, okay, this is this, this net, we now know what's going on and now we're all in, you know? And mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's what that gets you. Like the time you have to spend, it's like any investment. Do I want to spend my investment, my time and money into this thing? And is it actually, sustainable can we actually do it is it scalable is there enough is will the people work with us and uh, how, how do we control this in a way that that doesn't have some idiot come in and take advantage of the of the people and stuff like that and you, you don't know all of the answers but you certainly have we have we have certainly spent enough time uh figuring out as many aspects as possible. When we've had situations where someone came in um, to one of our suppliers, one of our suppliers took took off with them, and we we're like, we can't control you. Uh, and they came to find out uh, six nine months later that that person was going to screw them over, uh, and they did. And then they came back to us, and we're like, we're very sorry, we did that, and. Uh, we now know that we need to work with you because you guys have always been fair and true. And, and, and that's the thing of consistency. You like, we say what we're, we back up what we're going to say. And it's very important when you're dealing with indigenous people that, that are coming from zero and they mm. are listening to you. They've been screwed by people of my color before they've, they've already gone through that. So for them to trust you again, to trust someone else again is a big deal. And we take that seriously. So we have to live in integrity with that or else we're just contributing to an unsustainable situation again. And, uh, and we don't want to do that. Hmm. Makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Darren, look, uh, you, you, we could chat here for hours, but, um, you know, there's, there's so many interesting facets to what the work that you're doing. And it's, it's really, really enjoyable hearing your, your stories. What is, I know you're busy with a project at the moment that you can't really discuss too much at the moment, 
are there things that you're busy with uh, moving forward that you can tell us a little bit about? Yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, there's a fun project that you'll probably know uh, you'll find out about in the first quarter of next year. Um, uh, and then we can jump on and talk about it then. Uh, <laughs> and I'm in the process of that, uh, a lot of travel. Um, and, and then there's another project that I've been working on for the last few years that I, I, I can't really get into, but it's around mm -hmm. stem cells and, and, and how, uh, certain plant compounds can turn on, uh, the very important stem cells inside of our body. Um, and I'm working with a top, uh, researcher in that who holds over 50 patents. Uh, and we're, we're looking to do a lot of incredible work. Uh, and that really is turning on, uh, inside your body systemically, uh, some of the greatest, uh, healing potential that we know of. Uh, and, and we're identifying certain plant compounds that will, that will do that. And it's really, really exciting. And we have, um, we're working in the United States with the department of defense, uh, soon, uh, with some of the war veterans. Um, and so the, the plans around that will be really exciting. And, and I, I, I can't wait to talk about it and I can't wait to share it. Uh, because it's, 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 it's potential, it's potential is to be able to turn the body into its own, uh, healing machine. Uh, uh, and, and that, and that potential is, is, is so great that it will be less sawing off bones and cracking open hearts in order to solve uh, some of those so orthopedic hmm. issues and and uh, uh, heart disease issues. So so uh, anyway, it's a it's a it's a fun it's a fun project. So between that and many different aspects of of things I'm interested in, um, I'm doing a lot of digging into water right now, uh, talking to researchers about that, uh, heading uh, to uh, overseas to look into some stuff. And so water is a continued fascination of mine and, and it's a massive topic. It's a, it's a three hour conversation, but, but, uh, they're discovering things in water that is just from a quantum physics standpoint and a, and a non physical transfer of, of information, uh, that water is doing. Uh, it's just, it's just un unbelievable. And um, anyway, I don't want yeah. to open up that, that can of worms too much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's so exciting though, isn't it? Finding out all these new things which are sort of coming out because of, I guess, changes in technology and availability of information, mm. which, is, which is super cool. Absolutely. And, for sure. you know, just, just, just before we finish off, I, I'd just like to ask you, um, how uh, you and one of our previous guests, uh, Chris Killam, actually met each other or know each other because you know oh, yeah. you speak highly of him, he speaks highly of you. You're like superfood hunter, he's the medicine hunter. I mean, it, it must be an interesting story how you guys met. Yeah, he's 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 the best. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's funny because on one level, we do a lot of similar things, and uh, and and you know, we go out, we go explore, we go out, dig, and, and we, we both appreciate uh, plants from around the world and the indigenous people and how that gets to you and how that can help people. So we, we resonate on that level. Um, so we've always had this professional uh, respect for one another. And then over the years, uh, at least a decade, uh, we've just gotten to know each other. Um, uh, he's just, a, Chris is just a special human being. And I think the first time I actually met him, I was told about him. Uh, and it was in Peru. Uh, we just happened to be in Peru at the same time. And we met at a, some restaurant. Uh, 
and 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 we just shared stories and uh you know he's been going down to peru a lot longer than me uh and so you know i respect that i re i respect anyone who's willing to get their hands dirty to really see what's going on and from that perspective i think we both respect each other because we we've dedicated ourselves to that um and i just have the biggest respect for him uh and and uh yeah so a after that meeting uh we just always remained uh in contact and and there's several times we're exploring certain projects together and it's been it hasn't quite landed yet uh but we've always uh we've always known at some point uh we're going to do something together uh so it's just a matter of when and what that is but uh chris killam is the best man <laughs> you guys lead a a life that is so intriguing and interesting to you know everyone watching you guys so you really keep it up i have one more question what are your top three superfoods that you can recommend that maybe are gonna like be the three that really give you your best bang for your buck that most people probably could easily integrate into their lives tomorrow um i can't help but to say that probably my top choice is moringa oleifera so moringa leaves uh which can be powdered uh and you can pick up at most shops now um it's 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 contributing such a an array of constituents, uh, 35 to 36 antioxidants, high amounts of uh, vitamin C, vitamin A, chlorophyll, complete proteins. Uh, it, it's just, as they call it in Africa, uh, the vitamin tree. Uh, uh, so, so that one uh, for sure. Now listen, I, I don't think all Moringa is equal because it's very important how you process that, but that's too big of a conversation to get into. Um, again, see recommendations, find recommendations and find a good Moringa and you can add it to your smoothies. You can, you add it uh, to your things straight away. Um, and uh, I have to say getting one of the fungi uh, um, into the mix, uh, chaga mushroom is is probably my favorite um just because it's the you know come on you can't you can't not have the king king of all mushrooms in your in your daily mix uh there's several different ways to take that in there's companies that are doing dual extraction where you're getting water extracted and alcohol extraction to to amass as many constituents as possible so so when you're looking at chaga and you don't want to do it yourself, because you certainly can buy bulk mm. granulated chaga and you can boil it. And I've also done that too, or you can support companies that have already done it for you. Um, and that, that one's a good one, huge, huge antioxidants. Um, uh, and uh, such a great kind of one that you can always use to keep your immune system and a high regard and, uh, so, and I named my dog after Chaga, so so that's a that's one. Um, I would say, you know, just just in honor of the one I just drank. Uh, it's such a powerful one, Camu Camu. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's one of the greatest anti uh, vitamin C natural vitamin C bioavailable vitamin Cs on the planet. Uh, there's a, in Australia, there's a called a kudu plum, uh, which is also super high in vitamin C. So the Australians would say theirs is the highest and every, <laughs> everyone else will say camu camu, but, uh, I, I say cool, like <laughs> you know, eat, eat, eat it all. Uh, so I love camu camu. There's a lot of great research around, uh, the, the, uh, gallic acids and the antiviral antifungal anti-inflammatory around camu camu uh and also some great brain brain health uh aspects of camu camu so so for today i'll say moringa chaga and camu camu
Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to add those to my sort of daily consumption. Um, and yeah, just uh, how can people get hold of you and uh, also sort of support your uh, new business going forward? Yeah, so uh, I've got superlife.com, which I'm going to redo uh, for these new projects, uh, probably the first quarter of next year, but I'm st it's still out there, superlife.com, and then then the barukas.com where the nuts are and the information about them, B-A-R-U-K-A-S. And then all the social medias, I, I'm, I'm kind of on, on those here and there, uh, super life living. I'm, I'm around there. So, um, yeah, if any of your audience finds new superfoods or thinks I need to know something, I'm all for learning and growing and seeing if, 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 if it's worth it. So people can, can message me and, and, uh, uh, you never know. There could be a next new superfood that we're mm. we're not quite uh, integrated in using yet. So yeah, for sure. Cool, man, Darren. Uh, I just want to say, wow, what an awesome chat! It's uh, an absolute pleasure to finally like talk to you. It's, it's sort of like I said at the start. It's been on on uh, my wish list for such a long time, and it's over delivered, which is awesome. You you've been such a such a happy such a um interesting um guest and you you've lived such an unselfish life which is so amazing you know you just really want to help people um you really want to spread good stuff you want people to be healthier and better versions of themselves and it's just really inspiring and like the world needs more people like yourself you know and it's um it's just uh yeah it's an absolute privilege so Thank you so much for your time. And like, you know, we, we know we could have spoken for hours because there's so many things that we didn't even get a chance of talking to. So maybe one day in the future, we'll hopefully make a trip over to California and we can, I don't know, throw some kettlebells around or something and, and <laughs> come hang out in Malibu and that'll be awesome and have a good chat. So thank you so much for your time, man. I look forward to that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And just for my side briefly, you know, Gareth has really been, so excited to chat to you as well. And likewise, I mean, we've been really stoked and, and we were so grateful. And I must just say, like, I know this sounds like a silly thing to say, but just the way you speak is, is um, always shows something to me. I don't, I don't know how to really put it into really succinct uh, words, but you've got a calmness and a, a confidence and a charm about the way you deliver your information and it, I don't know, it just it sort of speaks to uh, the person uh, deeper down. So it's just been a pleasure to, to listen to you uh, talk about your life and, and we appreciate that. So we do look forward to coming to have a visit and I'm definitely looking forward to all your awesome new ventures that will be coming up in the next few months and we'll be sure to share that around. So thanks again. Right on fellas. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, cool, cool, man. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy 